My name's John MacArthur, and I'm a consultant trauma surgeon, and I work in Coventry. Uh, so this evening, we're going to cover pelvic and acetabular fractures, everything you need to know. Uh, so that's quite a broad topic. Um, so we've got a lot to get through. So we're going to talk a little bit about the diagnosis of these injuries and the mechanisms of injury. We're going to talk a bit about the assessment, both clinical and radiological. We're not going to go too much into classification, but try to bring it a bit back to a sort of mechanism of injury so it's a bit more relevant. And then we're going to talk about the emergency management and just a little bit about the definitive management. Now, I appreciate that not everything we're going to cover is relevant for everyone listening, but if there's anything that I skirt over that you want more of at the end, then we can, uh, we can discuss that at the end in, in the chat function. Okay, good. So pelvic and acetabular fractures, we always lump them together. Surgeons love to do that because they're kind of close by anatomically. The same surgeons tend to look after both of them, but they are kind of different injuries. So we'll be covering both tonight. and There's a bit of overlap. So when we talk about pelvic ring fra fractures, we are talking about the pelvic ring getting broken. It's this polomint theory that I'm sure you've heard about before. And that's that if you try to break a polomint, you can't break it just in one place. You have to break it in more than one place. And that's true of the pelvic ring. It's a ring of bone. You can't just break it in one place. Now, these are the injuries that are associated more commonly with sort of that catastrophic hemorrhage. These are the ones that can kill you and the ones that everybody tends to worry about. Acetabular fractures, well, that's an intra-articular fracture of the hip socket. So that can still be associated with really serious bleeding, but they tend to be more that they're associated with disability. So I, I remember one of my... it squashed it down now if i put this wall back and don't address that then this hip's going to be rattling around in that hip socket and it's not going to do very well so ct scans really really good reformats we said they um, aren't true images but they're still really useful so this is a reformat of a young man who uh, got knocked off his bicycle and if we got axial views of this, sometimes they can be a bit misleading because what they show, you'll see a line across here. That will be the axial view taking a slice and then it will take one here. And potentially when you get a slice at this level of this really horribly displaced kyphotic fracture with it sticking in his neural canal, you won't be able to see it very easily. Whereas as soon as you do your reformats, you can see it really obviously. And we talked a bit earlier about uh, clinical assessment. I remember this, this guy well. He, he was sort of fecally incontinent at the scene. And you, and you can kind of understand why with, uh, with the appearances there. So that's 2D reformats. And then the final thing we can get is 3D reformats. So this is actually the same patient as the last one. And we can see, well, yeah, it's actually really hard to see what's going on with his sacrum. But it allows us to see quite nicely. He's got all these fractures up here. He's got this internal rotation deformity of this right side of his pelvis. So it's a pretty bad injury, uh, but it allows us to get a nice gross overall picture with the 3D reformats. And, and they're quite nice to show patients, you know, they're, they're, they're easy to interpret. Cool, so binders and x-rays. So I want you to look at this image first. So this is a 3D reformat. This is a polytrauma patient. We've got some clues for that. They're unknown is their name. There's loads of cables everywhere. Um, and they've had a CT scan. To my eyes, this looks pretty normal. That synthesis looks pretty good. The SI joints look pretty good. You might just notice that there's a fracture of the transverse process up here. But this patient's in a lot of pain. They're shocked. Well, once we take their pelvic binder off, because they had a pelvic binder on when they were doing this, if we don't image it, we're going to think that that's how they are. So we often get an out of binder image, which is just a plain AP pelvis. And we can see that this patient's, their synthesis has fallen apart, their right SI joints open, their left SI joints open a little bit. So it's really important to get that out of binder x-ray. And those are normally done down in recess in any one where we've got that high clinical suspicion of an injury. So a little bit about classification, not too much. So starting with the pelvic ring. 
So Young and Burgess, they were a couple of radiologists. They came up with this uh, classification system, and it's based on mechanisms. So it's quite a useful classification system. So three main types, APC, lateral compression and vertical shear. And often when we've got really badly injured patients, you kind of can't classify it. And it looks like a bit of a mix of all of them. So APC, this isn't my typical Coventry patient uh, on the left here, but you can imagine that person is being squashed front to back, anterior, posterior compression. This is definitely my typical Coventry patient. This is somebody who's had a crash on their motorbike and you can see this deformation in the fuel tank here. That's because the bike has stopped, they haven't, and the patient has gone straight into that and it's squashed their pelvis front to back. And their x-rays look like this. So it's similar to that one we saw earlier with the uh, binder. So an APC, commonly known as an open book pelvic injury or an open book pelvic fracture. So if we look at this one first, we can see pubic synthesis is open. SI joints are really hard to interpret on a plain AP, much easier on an inlet view. Um, but we can Uh, they'll do a great job with that. If we are going to do a colostomy, our guidelines say we should do a distal washout. So that's basically where the stump of colon that connects to their rectum, we're going to flush that through. I don't tend to do that. That, that just doesn't make sense to me because you're flushing all that poo into your open wound. So we tend to leave it. It sits there until they're reconnected down the line. Um, but yeah, they're bad injuries, but a colostomy can either be because they've got that bowel injury and they need it for that. But as I say, for these perineal wounds, having a colostomy is really helpful for getting those to heal. So definitive management, if a fracture is displaced, then we're potentially going to think about fixing displaced acetabular fractures. Because as we've said, if we don't fix them and there's a big step in the articular surface, they're going to get arthritis they're going to get a pretty poorly functioning hip if it's non-displaced then by all means we can treat them non-operatively as long as we can get them up if that fracture needs protective weight bearing and say it's a frail elderly patient if it's someone who's multiply injured then we might still consider doing an intervention such as fixing it to allow it, allow that patient to rehab so some of the things we can do we talked about uh, fixing it. So uh, the decision is whether we fix it or replace it. This image up here, this is a youngster. She's uh, been ejected from a car. We can see all of the lines that we'd want to draw around her acetabulum are broken. It's in loads of pieces, but she's young. You know, she's got good bone and it's like a jigsaw. So we can potentially put that jigsaw back together. And that's what we've done here. We've put it back together. Her hip socket now looks like a hip socket and she, she does well. So we've got got an anatomical reduction, and she's gone on to do well after that. If we've got older patient, nerve injuries, so they get a foot drop, or if there's fractures going up around the grade static notch, they can also get a supragluteal nerve palsy. So they're going to get a horrible, limping, lurching Trendelenburg gait, and they're going to hate that. Pelvic ring fractures. If you've got a significant pelvic ring injury, sadly, you're not going to be the same again. You're going to have some chronic pain almost certainly, usually around your back. We've talked about the fact that if we leave them with it in a funky position, then they're either going to get sitting imbalance or leg length discrepancy, and they're not going to thank you for that. Sexual and genital urinary dysfunction, really common after pelvic ring injuries. You can imagine if everything's been ripped at the front to the point where you're bleeding to death and it's ruptured your urethral, guess what? The nerves to everything aren't going to work as well. And this is true for men and women. They can both have sexual and genital urinary dysfunction. And it's really important that we ask them about it because we're not very good at asking them about it, particularly as orthopedic surgeons. And we've talked about the, the nerve injuries that you can get either sort of sciatic nerve or spinal nerve roots or nerves that supply the bowel and the bladder. So summary, pelvic and acetabular fractures, potentially both of them can be life-threatening, particularly, particularly the pelvic ring, but they're all life-changing injuries. 
Sometimes the imaging might not look that bad, but we have to have that really high index of suspicion that they've got a severe injury and keep an eye out for it and get that appropriate good imaging. When it comes to resuscitation, binder, transfusion, and warming them up is usually all that we're going to need to do in the vast majority of cases. They are tricky injuries, though. They've got serious complications, and they obviously need early specialist review. And that's me done. Thank you.